the core, uh, I, uh, I guess, concept of, of, of supervillos that caught my eye is that it's such an interesting, complex thing that tried to do a lot of stuff in a very, very simple way. Um, and it's essentially a modular typographic system that was used to create uh, type, uh, illustrations, and orn ornamentation. So immediately, it kind of set off all of my alarm bells, all of the things I like. It just kind of hit all of the, the spaces that I was really curious about. Um, and I came across a album in the Lubalan archive many, many years ago, and I just couldn't make any sense of it. It just was so weird and so awesome at the same time. I really had to understand it uh, <laughs> in, in a more succinct kind of way. Uh, but as soon as I saw it, there's this really interesting magical quality to it, and I'm hoping to kind of impart some of that um, today and, and kind of paint a broader picture for it. But essentially what we're going to be looking at is this awesome, awesome thing. This is one of the promotional pieces from, from that. But in combination, uh, the typographic, the modular system essentially kind of starts to look like this, and it's profoundly uh, deep and surprisingly, surprisingly varied, which is what's kind of, you know, what you hope for a modular system that could do lots of different things. So to properly kind of uh, contextualize it, so as I said, like it set off all of, all of my curious curiosity alarm bells, and I, I wanted to sort of delve into all of those things and so, sort of to create the proper conditions to establish kind of how this system came to be, how this... Um, uh, project came to be. So the, the context of ornamentation and typography goes quite far back, uh, surprisingly f far back. And we're talking about cut metal, you know, sort of cast type. So the earliest uh, examples of, of ornamentation that starts to influence the shapes of, of letter forms goes back as far as around 1690s. Uh, there's a British foundry uh, Thomas Grover foundry that created a, a typeface that was eventually called Union Pearl, probably in honor of the unification of uh, Scotland and England. Um, but it's the first time uh, typeface attempted to bring in these visually ornamental elements right into the letter forms. So there's this divide, letters are letters, ornament, if there is ornament, it's an ornament, but this is sort of a, a graphic attempt at kind of reconciling the two spaces. Another really important uh, figure and uh, aspect of ornamentation and typography was the work of Father Sebastian Truchet, who uh, was active in the middle of uh, 17th century and into the 18th century. He was part of the Bignon Commission that, that created the context and the groundwork for the Romain de Roy uh, typeface, that, or the family of typefaces that were created for the imprimerie, the royal imprimerie. Um, what's really interesting uh, about Father Truchet is he was a mathematician, he was an inventor, he was a hydrologist. He uh, built most of the canals in, in France, uh, at least devised a lot of the canals. He, was, he had a very keen eye uh, for things, and he was uh, the story supposedly is that he was visiting a cathedral, uh, looking at some canal work that he was doing somewhere in, in uh outside of Paris, and he walked into a cathedral and noticed the floor. And the floor had a very simple tile pattern. It was essentially a square tile that was divided exactly in half. The top half was black, the bottom half was white. So he didn't see, he didn't notice the whole thing with, with you know, he's a very uh, uh, good eye for things. He noticed the element that made it. And he saw this really beautiful complex pattern and realized that it was only made with one piece. That's sort of the beauty of, of a complex pattern is that all you need is one piece that can, in permutation, can create a lot of uh, possibilities. So if you take that, that modular unit, right, the beauty of a square is you can rotate, rotate it uh, 90 degrees and you have essentially four shapes out of one unit. And then just depending on how you link it, the combinations are pretty endless. So it's, it's this a strangely amazing thing of like using something so simple to create a, a very vast array of options. So he sketched it out, he kind of uh, dabbled in, in sort of what that was and left notes and some of the writing and some of the stuff, uh, it, this is now called the Truchet tile uh, in, in honor of his name. So this is well known in math and has implications in, in other spheres, but it, it's in a way the the, the simplest way of thinking about ornamentation and typography and typesetting. You know, you're limited by size, you're limited by scale, 
And why not create something that gives you a lot of possibilities out of a very simple unit? Um, so you could see the extrapolation from this. He, um, this his his um, ornamentation theory didn't really go into Romain de Bois, but people like Fournier. Uh, this is the uh, just as a, as a reference. This is sort of the some of the plates from 1704 for the Romain de Bois, and you can even see like the, the little tiling kind of played out uh, played a role in the in the bottom of the plates. Um, but Fournier uh, was aware of the work that, that uh, Trochet was doing. Fournier was trained as a wood engraver, and he had done some uh, ornamentation in wood, realized the potential of this Trochet uh, modular system, of sort of this tile system, and kind of extrapolated something out of that and started creating um, some ornamentation. It wasn't really using the Trochet tile system. He wasn't making a pure half and half. But he saw the, um, he kind of extrapolated the, the context from it that, that helped him conceive of um, the ability to do ornamentation at different scales uh, using very simplified forms, essentially kind of breaking down a complex pattern into modular units that you can link together. So this is some of uh, Fournier's uh, ornamentation. This is really like, the as far as... Um, excessive ornamentation, kind of the beginning of the excessive ornamentation that happens sort of around this time in the, in the mid-18th century, uh, just just before the mid-18th century. Uh, this is from the manual, uh, uh, well, not the manual, this is a sample book that, that Fournier put out, and, and uh, Pierre, I should, I should specify, Pierre Simon Fournier. Um, and some of these ideas started kind of trickling across the continent. Uh, Jean, uh, Jacques-Francois Rosart, uh, uh, punch cutter living in the Low Countries, mostly kind of based in what's now uh, the Belgian sort of region. He did quite a bit of ornamentation. So a, a better known contemporary of his is Fleischmann. Uh, they were, I'd say, a little bit competitive. Um, they both uh, created a, kind of a new Dutch style of, of, of type. Rosart struggled kind of under the... the um, he had a lesser reputation. I think he, he constantly struggled that Fleischmann was better known, but he created a lot more um, interesting things. He, he was better known for music types, and he did a lot of these ornamentation things. These are tarotes, like um, essentially patterns that could be printed for, for tarot cards, and it was a very useful um, tool for a lot of printers. Uh, so, But the, the methodology is also very similar. If you can break down a complex pattern into very small, simple shapes, and you could just reuse you know the left side, the right side, the middle part. You can you can create a lot of a lot of stuff, and this is a true uh, uh, terre like one of these pattern uh, devices for printing of kind of a continuous pattern that is done later. It's a 19th century design <coughs> to do the terre but this is uh, based on the Truchet tile. So this is a pure uh, no, uh, extrapolation of that idea, half and half. And you can see, you know, if you rotate the pieces, you can create a lot of possibilities, a lot of permutation. But you can see, you know, essentially it's half and half. You know, if you, if you look sort of in between the tiles, you can see the one half is black, one half is white, the black side is uh, incised. And if you start looking at that uh, late, 18, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, a lot of um, type founders are producing quite elaborate um, designs and in, in uh, ornamentation using similar principles you know like I said you take a complex design you break it down into smaller elements and you can cast things consistently and you can lock things up and, and create uh, a lot of really beautiful uh, designs another influence within uh, the history of, of, of printing and the history of typography is the artistic printing movement that, that tried to exploit as much as they could from uh, material that could be done in the printing press, you know, not trying to do anything uh, as an engraving, really just relying on, on, the, on the, uh, the stuff that you have in the, in the type shop, you know, locking forms and creating curved forms, setting type, like making type do things that it never did. You know, they're, they're influenced by... Um, engraving, they're, interest, they're, they're influenced by uh, photolithography or lithography and then chromolithography, but they're trying to limit themselves to what you can do with, within the printing press and uh, really trying to show off. They started using very, very fancy inks and, and very complex uh, levels of printing. Uh, most of the UK and, and United States are sort of in this uh, arms race of who is going to do uh, better artistic printing. Uh, and as an extrapolation of that, the uh, 
some of the founders, of course, always sort of get in on, on the trends. You know, they started noticing the trends of how the printers are doing these things and then said, hey, we can start making these things for you. Uh, McKellar, Smith & Jordan, um, which is... Uh, whose lineage traces uh, to the first uh, American type foundry, the first uh, American designs uh, are um, in the background of McKellar, Smith & Jordan, um, Binney and Ronaldson, which is uh, the first surviving uh, 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 type foundry in the United States that created the first American typefaces printed and cast here or rather than matrices that were brought over from, from overseas. Um, they eventually become McKellar, Smith & Jordan and McKellar, Smith & Jordan in, in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, late 19th century, they got absorbed into ATF, but they, they're known for creating very, very elaborate ornamental pieces that sometimes would turn into design. So they would take things that were meant for ornamentation and designers would, or printers in this case, would turn them into letters. <laughs> it's a strange sort of inversion. That's not what Michael Smith Jordan intended, but here you go. Here's letter forms that kind of turn into it itself. Like this is mostly for borders and images. You can, you can create these um, complex things, including things like buildings and houses. You know, like there's enough material, there's enough furniture, so to speak, uh, real uh, <laughs> ornamental furniture with doors and windows that you could buy a kit from McKellar, Smith & Jordan and you can make beautiful complex illustration just on the, on the whole page. So this is uh, from Bound & Company down in uh, New York City's uh, seaport. They have uh, some material from McKellar, Smith & Jordan and you know, here's, here's a lockup of a house. Yeah, it's pretty pretty legit it's a, it's a good looking house um, and then you, as you get as you inch into the the, the 1920s and 1930s you see a lot of foundries making this sort of stuff and promoting this kind of stuff using essentially ornamental pattern pieces to make images and illustrations it makes sense on a practical level if you're printing letterpress, you don't have to put anything else in there. You can just rely on the stuff you have in the, in the cases. You don't need to have an engraving, which takes a bit of work. Uh, you have to make sure that it's type high. It's, it's just an extra piece of work that, that's, you know, it's not cumbersome, but it does take, take time. Um, so why not maybe use this, the stuff you have? And also just, it's, it's curious, it's novel, it looks different, right? You can make an engraving that looks like that building you can make an engraving it looks like those flowers but you're not going to get that sort of texture you're not going to get that uh, look and feel for it so it made sense that you know it creates a new uh, new formal language right off the bat uh, so this is from Ludwig and Meyer uh, a lot of this is in, in Germany uh, this is a student piece from Dusseldorf from 1928 um, where they're using rules they're using uh, ornamental uh, structural elements that are used for delineating tables and charts and, and, and they're using them to create imagery. Um, so printers are dipping into their into their cases and, and finding novel ways of making designs. Um, and this is a student project so a lot of the students in studying printing, printing apprentices are starting to kind of dabble in this stuff and there's a, there's a kind of a, a natural context around this as well but this is a designed by, by uh, Fritz Ritter from Munich. It's done completely using, it's, it's I think a New Year's card for 1928, uh, done entirely using uh, the available ornamentation. But some of this has uh, forms and, and stuff that foundries are also making in line with this stuff. So it's not just kind of out of the box uh, ornamentation stuff where um, borders, they're a little bit too limiting. This is this is much more complex, and these shapes are coming from foundries that are creating these things. Um, in in the cases up front, uh, are some examples of the foundries that are doing this this sort of work. This is fantastic. This is a uh, from Haas, uh, Basel from 1920s. It's not Helvetica Haas. This is completely something else, uh, but same company. Uh, chromatic. You, know, you can see the sort of. This pixel, pixel art, early pixel art, um, it's kind of amazing. Um, the other bit of context around this is sort of the, the general modern movement and part of the reason why that stuff is looking the way it does, and part of the reason why those founders are making these things is there's this general movement within uh, the art, art scenes towards uh, modularity and sort of modernism as we sort of start to define modernism. But 
you start to find this uh, graphic simplification. Uh, Van Doisberg's design using the same elements, essentially, stuff that you can have in the print shop um, to construct letter forms that could have width and, and, and compression just based on how you uh, put the pieces together. If you look closely, if you ever have a chance to see the original or kind of the original print, you could make out the little edges between where the type locks up or like the border pieces lock up. So it's not cast type, it's not made type, it's just made into, you know, just elements. And the freedom that allows is, is, is fantastic. You're not uh, stuck with sort of these classical forms that, that a lot of these folks were sort of rebelling against. And the freedom of the press, the freedom sort of of the printing press rather, like how you could move uh, material around and use uh, these things to become um, more graphic and, and to be a little bit more uh, interesting and then kind of break the monotony of this kind of locked in uh, rectilinearity of the page. Uh, again, on Doisberg in 1925, you see this happening in, in Soviet Union with the constructivists are also trying to break the plane, they're looking for models. And you know, there's a close relationship between Dada, Futurists, and, and uh, De Stil, uh, Russian constructivist, uh, uh, Hungarian constructivist, the Czech constructivist. You know, especially in this case, uh, Lasitsky spent a lot of time in Germany going back and forth and, and talking to, to people who were teaching in Bauhaus. This isn't necessarily what Bauhaus visually looks like, but there's, a, there's an aspect of this interest in these simplified uh, modular forms. Rochenko's work, uh, a, a lot of the lettering that he would do for uh, uh, publications that he was doing is, is also very uh interest in these very simplified uh, geometric forms that kind of give uh, the page a uh, greater uh, vitality. Uh, Yu Schmidt, who taught at the Bauhaus, and uh, he made uh, this sort of lettering uh, study in 1925 that influenced other designers. And uh, the, the piece on the right is his um, design for a uh, prospectus for Bauhaus. Uh, again, like the Bauhaus doesn't look, doesn't all look like that. I think that, that there's a misconception that Bauhaus design is ex always like that. There's a lot of traditional typefaces. There's a lot of traditional layouts. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's not so simple. <laughs> Uh, and if you're curious, there's a fantastic article uh, on fonts and use about Bauhaus typography and the comments is where it gets really, really interesting where you kind of see the, the full extent of how things uh, really were. So there is a tendency within some of the masters, within some of the artists, within some of the students to go towards these things, but that's not, they're not creating a Bauhaus style per se. That, that all comes later and now we sort of think of it that way, but it's, it's about a bit messier in, in a good way. Um, Herbert Baer, uh, his in, in investigation of this universal typeface is, is rooted in the work that Hugh uh, Schmidt is doing in 1925. Uh, Joseph Albers, his work uh, in the 1920s for these uh, stencil and kind of modular uh, devices is also uh, kind of in the same space. And you can see the, the modularity there, especially in the one on the right. Uh, it's just a simplified set of units, a uh, very small subset that you can mix and match and make new letter forms. You don't have to um, do anything using existing type. You can do something using custom made pieces and these custom made pieces are derivative of the uh, uh, work that uh, these printers are doing anyway. They're, they're using rules and they're using this material. And again, foundries catch up. They're seeing what's going on and they're trying to accommodate that, that desire, that need and saying like, here, have a lot more stuff to play with. Uh, and, and they're making these amazingly robust things. Uh, this is a companion to Futura, which was uh, kind of an or ornamentation, borders and uh, ornaments specifically made to match Futura. It's kind of, there's a similar proportion to it. It's called schmuck, but it's, you know, it means ornaments. Um, and you can see how they're applying, and uh, there's a few specimen books that, that show this, and, but it's kind of a lesser known bit about Futura that it had these companions. Uh, there's sort of the, the, the kind of more stylized Futura, sort of at, at the bottom there, the, the heavier weight, but there's also these amazing uh, pieces that go into it. Um, not to be a down, not uh, Stempel, the, the other big uh, German manufacturer, of course, had their own, and they're about a few years apart. They're very close together, so um, they're 
creating um, material in the same way. They're trying to accommodate uh, this need uh, and at also different sizes. So when you have a lot of different sizes, you can do much more, right? Like it doesn't, you're not stuck with uh, the same size elements that creates, but you can take, let's say, on the right, the bigger pieces and mix them with the smaller pieces because it's metal tight. You know, as long as you can lock it up, you know, and, and, and printers are doing complex lockups at this point anyway, you can do a lot of really cool things. Uh, there's also some, some student projects. This is uh, some student work in uh, Stuttgart at the Kunstgewerbe Schule in, in, in Stuttgart, or right, late 20s, I'd say, 28, 29. Um, same idea, similar idea that, that Joseph Albers is exploring, like how can you make letter forms out of a, a kit of parts? You know, how do you, what, what kind of shapes, what kind of pieces do you need in order to make uh, a full alphabet? And both of these are pretty serious looking alphabets. I mean, they're, they're different, but they're, they're legit again, like they're, they're letter forms. And so if you move away from the conventional understanding of what a letter form used to look like, and you kind of open up the boundaries, it, it's, it's pretty vast territory. Um, in Italy, Nebbiolo, there's a, a specimen of, of, of this in the case and at the, at, by the front entrance from Letter from Archive, Frederick Mekanov by uh, design by Giulio de Milano. Uh, Aldo Novarese didn't do everything for Nebbiola. There's a lot of other people. Uh, Giulio de Milano is an important uh, figure for Nebbiola. In the uh, mid 30s, he designed this uh, uh, typeface again, made of a uh, kit of parts. You just buy the pieces and you could see how you can make a super tall letter like that R or the A, or you can make something super wide and heavy like the A. You can make something very short and you can also change the, the shapes you have. Kind of, you can make an A that has a kind of an apex to it. You're going to make an A that's rounder. You can do a lot of, a lot of stuff with this as long as you have the right elements. And so it shows the, the elements right at the top. Um, and this, they also made an inverted version of it called uh, Frege Razzanale. Um, so it's kind of like a knockout, you know, so this is <laughs> the best way they could show it. It's fantastic as, a, as an image, this guy putting together these little bricks. Uh, same, same time. In the state side, ATF also made something that was very, very similar. Uh, the Alpha Blocks, which is also in the case, um, uh, made around 1944 and, and lasted for quite a while. It was used, uh, a lot of type shops have it. Uh, a lot of type shops have it. They have no idea what it is, but it's Alpha Blocks. Uh, it's weird stuff, um, but it's kind of awesome. Same thing, like if you env can envision something, you can make it. And I've seen some really uh, elaborate designs using alpha blocks, like that star, you know, you can switch color midway. It's totally doable. You can you can do a lot of stuff. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a complex set that allows you to, you know, make letters if you wanted to. You can make illustrations, but all in the case, all sort of in the, in the uh, printing bed, rather. Um, Cassandra's bifewer for uh, De Bernier Peignot, uh, a typeface also that, that is looking for these uh, formal limitations and extrapolating kind of a, a, a space where uh, Cassandra could find a really beautiful combination of things, breaking it down into essentially a series of solid forms and shading either through color or uh, through gradient uh, and creating this, uh, it's a little maybe harder well, I guess you could see it. The, the gray parts are just a series of single lines. Uh, they're sort of, uh, it's, a, it's, it's gray because it's black lines that are thin, that are spaced out um, together. Um, this is one of the promotional books that um, Cassandra designed for. It's amazing. Uh, but it's something that is indicative of that time. There's, there's a tendency on kind of across the spectrum from the uh, avant-garde artists and also down to the trade. Uh, they're interested in the, by this potential art deco as a huge visual uh, role that it plays. And then there's kind of this, uh, this, this notion of modernism and modernist. So like the, the, the terms are not synonymous. They're, they're different ideas and, and they both explore kind of more geometric forms, but they're doing it in different ways. Modernism uh, has, has a different philosophy behind it. Modernistic is you know, sort of more of the art deco, more of the uh, visually uh, expressive things and a little bit more commercial. Uh, but you see a lot of this work uh, pretty much across uh, everywhere, you know, in, in the 1920s, 1930s, especially in 1930s, this, this Art Deco style and this kind of limited um, palette is pushing 
uh, a lot. Like you could see, this is from 1932, a, a Parisian design. Uh, they're using those those elements. They're using, uh, especially kind of if you look at the bottom there, uh, on the bottom right, the the pieces are those um, uh, uh, modular elements that they're putting together. A lot of printers are also uh, taking these. Uh, part of the reason why the foundry started doing this this kind of sales pitch to uh, the, these printers is that they started noticing that people were taking these ornamental pieces like lines and, and just solid shapes and would file them and make inlines with them or kind of cut things in them or turn them or, or shave, file stuff off to make new forms. So they're taking like existing blanks essentially that would you know, print solid and they're making a single line or maybe a double line. Kind of the, the you know, what's, what's shown kind of on the left there, creating a different visual texture or uh, more like those B, those constructed B. So it's a half a circle, and if you just take a file and you just cut uh, a line into it and line it, you can print uh, something that has a new, you don't need two pieces, you don't need a, a rectangle next to it, you can make the half circle look different. So the founders are seeing that the printers are doing this, and they're kind of trying to accommodate, saying, hey, you can buy this you know, out of the box, and here we can sell you more type this way. But it's, it's something that um, they're trying to expand on um, the stuff that they have without doing too much. You know, all of a sudden, like, you get a slightly visually different, different texture to it. And the biggest factor, of course, in all of this uh, story is that this is a Spanish design. Super Veloz was made in, in Barcelona uh, after the Civil War. And the Spanish Civil War played a huge role in, in all of this. Uh, Super Veloz wouldn't really exist without the, the Spanish Civil War. Uh, if, if anything, like the, the, these forms would be constructed out of uh, existing typefaces, this was something that had a huge impact on the, the printing scene. And this is where um, the story gets a little bit more complex. But if you start looking at Spanish design, it's very much in step with what's going on in the rest of Europe. Uh, even, I would say, especially in the early 30s during the, the Republic, the Second Spanish Republic, uh, there's a greater tendency towards making things even more geometric. Uh, they're taking the visual cues that they're seeing uh, design work that's happening in France. There's a, a very strong influence of uh, Soviet design that comes into Spain because of the sort of natural uh, affinity between the Spanish Republic and the, and the Soviet government, and there's a lot of support back and forth, mostly from one side. Uh, but they're seeing a lot of this constructivist work, they're seeing a lot of this uh, graphic uh, design, and a lot of the commercial work uh, that's made in, in the Spanish sector, mostly books, posters, are very much uh, influenced by this uh, geometric and ornamentality. It's it's a really kind of untapped uh, space. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for more people to delve into the Spanish design because it's if you start looking for books, then there are lots of them out there, and they're not very expensive. Uh, it's just kind of an untapped market. But the Spanish books of the 30s are phenomenal. The Constitution of <laughs> Spain uses the feature, that kind of uh, stylized feature. It's very much in, in, in vogue of, of what's, what's going on. Uh, there's a series of really amazing designers that are worth uh, kind of uh, their own space, their own books, their own articles, because the, the work is just so phenomenal. Um, there's an influence of Hartfield, the, the photo collage, photo montage, similar to you know what, what is going on in Soviet Union. The Lasitsky, Rachenko are making these very complex uh, photo montages, and there's a different, a slightly different aesthetic here, but it's it's very much coming from from those uh, places. Uh, you know, there's a yeah that you could see the direct influence of, of sort of the publishing in uh, the Soviet publishing influenced uh, the Spanish scene. Um, this is a actually these are theater programs. Uh, this this uh, uh, was published um, from the, around 1927 or 26, if I'm not mistaken, all the way through the mid to late 30s. And the aesthetic of these covers of these. Um, theater programs stayed pretty consistent. They, they kind of kept to this stenciled form, this very geometric stencil form in diff, slightly different ways. Later in the 30s, it became a little bit more pictorial. In the, oddly, strangely, in the late uh, uh, 20s, it was much more graphic and much more minimal, and then it gets a little bit more, it, it makes sense in the context of Spain, but uh, 
visually sort of uh, a little bit in, in inverse. Um, Hartfield even designed uh, things for for uh, Spanish publishers. So this is a, a publisher in Madrid. This is from 1931. It's a lot of exchange. There's a lot of things happening in, in Spain uh, in this in this period that uh, we don't know much about, sadly, strangely. Um, I mean, these are just so fantastic, and it, it's it's a lot of it is out there. It doesn't t it doesn't take a lot to to kind of dig these up. Um, the piece on the right is the from Catalonia, 1932. Uh, the designer, uh, Nornai Ignacio Zabala, is, is a, a well-known 1930s uh, graphic designer in, uh, in Barcelona, in, in Catalonia. A stamp, uh, Joseph Sala is another um, uh, important uh, Catalan graphic designer of the 30s. And the newspapers, the, you know, the mastheads of the flags of the newspapers are phenomenal. This is all from late 20s, early 30s. You know, they're all using similar forms. I mean, it's like, you, you, it's, it's not hard to kind of do a quick dig at uh, some of the Spanish newspapers and you, you start looking at them. More than half of them look this way. And like they're clued in, they're tapped into the, in the entire context. They're, they're sharp, they're, they're, they know that this makes sense and it kind of positions them in a particular light. It, it sort of, you could see sort of this Republican feel this kind of very um, workman uh, spirit to it. It's not fancy. It's not classical. It's it's rough, a bit rough, strong. You know, so these these visual connotations come through. It's not serif. It's not classical. It's it's new. It's 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 refreshing, and it means that they're sort of you know they're kind of looking at the future. They're looking forward. You know, it's it's no surprise that futurists also kind of love this this graphic form. And the same thing that happened in Germany happened in Spain. The Spanish type foundries create uh, ornamental uh, pieces. This is a Jose Aranzo um, a type foundry. In, uh, they had an office in Madrid and Barcelona. Uh, they created their uh, ornamental uh, kit that they're very actively promoting in making letters. Uh, so the dominant form in this specimen book is they show the kit of parts, but they also show quite a lot of lettering, which you don't, you do see it in the, in the German books, but this is heavily leaning towards that because it's a lot easier to do letter forms within a uh, printing bed when you have these things. So essentially what they're showing here is like, you could do everything here using all of that and just add an additional typeface kind of at the bottom and you're done. You have uh, an image, you have uh, uh, an illustration, you have everything. It plays into the context of what's there. Um, there's another page from that book. It's really beautiful. Um, two color, you know, but you know, we're talking about very small printers. We're talking about jobbing printers. You know, the other the other important part of this whole story is that printers are the designers. Like, this is a period when you don't have necessarily a need or a strong field of graphic designers that are middlemen between the client and the printer. So the clients go to the printers and the printers design for them. Like if you need a small ad or if you need a wine label, you don't need a designer, you don't need an artist to make it. You just go to the printer and say, I have this thing, I need this thing, it needs to say this, can you help me? And they help you. They, they typeset it and they print it for you. So, you know, we're used to thinking that we need someone to make the stuff before it gets printed. Well, you know, in, in a lot of the 30s and it's the same United States, 20s, 30s, the printers are the designers. You know, they're trained and they're doing the best they can. You know, so obviously the quality is a little bit wonky. There's, there's an inconsistency, but they're not going to necessarily need to bring someone outside. They can just do it themselves. And so that's, and the clients are going directly to them. And these printers are trying to stay trendy. They're trying to keep up with what's going on and they're seeing things, but they're trickling you know it's sort of it's it's a um it's it's their interpretation of this avant-garde like what they see and what they can do is a little different you know like so there's this dilution that happens but dilution sometimes in in a direct sort of very literally it's just diluted and it's not as good sometimes it's the dilution that turns into something unique and something interesting you know this whole notion of vernacular does sometimes make things more interesting, thus make things better. Um, but this is mostly for, you know, for these jobbing printers. They have very small jobs. Uh, these clients need very small things and they just don't want to fuss with it, you know, or have to pay for a uh, high cost of engravings. 
And the graphic uh, design, the sort of the more professional, I guess, artists, the commercial artists that are active uh, right on the cusp of the Spanish Civil War are really, really distinct. And, and um, the design of the um, propaganda during the Spanish Civil War is, is really uh, profound and very, very vast. Uh, and, and graphically, visually, they're very easy to tell apart. You don't have to be um, a scholar to understand who's who's on what side. Uh, the phalangist, in this case, the uh, the sort of the fascists of, of Spain, uh, who were very much anti-republic. Uh, there's also the monarchists. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of folks that are not interested in the in the republic and want to bring things back to a certain order. Uh, their stuff is very. Um, Photorealistic or, or real, realist. Uh, they're 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 interested more in the pictorial. They're not interested in these graphic, uh, simplified uh, abstractions. They're very much interested in these like people and and like you know this is all uh, the one on the right is uh, anti-Marxism, uh, but they're creating these very strong visuals using imagery and very powerful imagery. But even even within their work, you could see the. It's really hard to ditch the simplified uh, graphic forms. You know that that lettering on the bottom left there is is from that Spain. Um, another couple from the Falanges. Um, that's there. You can you can definitely get the drift of, of what they're trying to do. But again, like I said, uh, that the middle piece of lettering on the poster on the left, like it's the same same roots. It's it's a kind of graphic. So they have this like very strong rejection of this very simplified abstraction. But they're still using it anyway. It's 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 kind of cuts both ways. But the 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 socialist, the Republican posters are graphically a little bit different. Um, but the war has uh, wreaks an intense havoc on the country. I mean, like the 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 it's a devastating thing that happened to to Spain. Uh, the Republicans eventually lost out to Franco, or Franco kind of was instrumental in kind of positioning himself at the end of the war and, and, and ruled for a very long time uh, in Spain as, as a dictator essentially. Um, but the, the, the fighting was pretty intense and, and, and it did a huge amount of damage to a lot of the industry. It took a long time for Spain to kind of come out of this period and, and um, one of the heaviest hit places were uh, small towns uh, where a lot of the battles were fought. And the printers basically were left with not much uh, material. Uh, forget printing. You know, you need stuff. You need. You, you, it's like printing is not that essential uh, when when the country is completely sort of broken apart and splintered to such a degree. And you have to kind of piece the lives back together. Um, but a lot of the printers to this day, you know, they're towns that have you know fifty thousand uh, uh, population or or smaller. Um, don't have proper printing facilities. They still don't have photo engraving. Like it, it's basically just kind of stopped. Time stopped for a lot of these towns, and so things just happen elsewhere. The the big cities do stuff. Uh, the big cities were able to pick themselves up, but small cities are still probably in some ways reeling from from the Spanish Civil War. It's a it's a it's a phenomenally brutal uh, thing that happened there. Um, you know the, the 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 scale of bombings and and you know everything that happened in in the 30s is really profound. But here's a bomb shelter in Valencia in 1937, uh, and the architectural lettering is coming from the same roots. You know it's like the same uh, stylized modular forms, these kind of very geometric forms. So this is a piece of lettering for a bomb shelter. <laughs> And it's very much in keeping with, with the aesthetic of the time. It's Art Deco, but it's also very much from this very particular strain of Art Deco. And the biggest factor, as I said, is the photo engraving. Uh, basically, photo engraving got wiped out in Spain. Uh, and just to kind of show you how complex photo engraving is, this is an American Photo Engravers Association manual of how photo engraving works. Um, essentially, the you know, I'll show you the slides, but the, the basic gist of photo engraving is you have uh, a metal plate that uh, gets coated with photosensitive material. Um, that material reacts to light and hardens. Uh, the parts that are exposed to light, they harden. Uh, and when you put acid or some kind of uh, acidic material on it, it eats away at the stuff that wasn't hardened. So anything that wasn't exposed to light, right, part of the positive-negative image, the positive side 
gets hardened, the negative parts don't, and they get washed out essentially by this acid. So you have a recessed, you have a raised surface. And it can be tacked to a plate, and then you can print from it. So it can be printed in exactly in the same bed. So this goes through and shows you the various stages of the photography. And then you have to strip it. Uh, and then you have to uh, add the, the chemistry to uh, the plates. And then you can etch the plate by, you know, it could be done in zinc or it could be done in copper. Uh, and it's a very labor intensive process that a lot, uh, relies on a lot of different steps. I mean, like, you know, if you don't have a camera, then that's it. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do it. And, and this stuff usually would have to be done somewhere else. Um, the, the 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 drawings are pretty amazing, like the the echo on the on the guys, so this 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 weird thing. It's like a sci-fi movie. Um, routing, you have to route out the excess material so it doesn't. It's it's lighter. It's not as heavy. It's also some you know stuff that doesn't need to get printed. You have to do a lot of finishing of this. You have to like then cut them down, get them to be squared off so you can lock it up in, in, the, in the bed. Uh, you do finishing, you have to use these special calipers to test the entire bed of the surface to see, to make sure that it's at the right height. <laughs> if it's not at the right height, it's not gonna print. You're gonna have areas that print and areas that don't print. So the guy in the, um, where is this? Uh, somewhere, he's got this like, um, the little, it's hard to see, there's like this little special kind of caliper that he's testing the, the depth of the engraving. And then you check it, test it, wrap it, ship it, <laughs> and you're done. But this is insane. I mean, this is, this is normal, but like there's, there's no way that a lot of these printers could do this sort of work, especially like devastated from, from the Spanish Civil War. So here's where sort of the main, the main player for Supervelos comes in, uh, Juan Tarchut. Um, this is him as a young man in probably around 20 years old. He was born in 1920. Uh, and a little bit later on the, on the right, this is from Alex Trichut, uh his grandson. This is uh, a really amazing sort of lineage uh, of, of the Trichut family, uh, skipping a generation. But uh, there's this really interesting link between, if you guys are familiar with Alex's work, um, it starts to make sense when you see. But there's a missing link, and it's kind of a more organic than, than it actually seems. It's not a direct, he didn't know you know, his grandfather's uh, uh, space. But um, Juan, um, did type, uh, his, so his father uh, was born in, in France, moved across the border into uh, Basque country and eventually made his way down to Catalonia and settled in Catalonia. Uh, and he owned a printing uh, plant, he, he, or, 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 or a, he was a printer, he had a small, small scale printer. Uh, he was printing in France before he uh, moved to Spain. But he kept, you know, he was doing some of that in, in uh, the Basque country, and then he also started doing that in Barcelona or near Barcelona. So his son is born essentially into a printing family, and his son is interested in, in letter forms. He designed a few typefaces. Uh, Juventud is the sort of probably the better known of his typefaces. It was also sold in France under a different name, Uriel. Uh, Fondry Typographique uh, Francaise was the, the uh, a foundry that had very close links to Catalonia, mostly because of the civil war, the effects, the after effects of civil war. There's a few people who moved because of the war over to Sp uh, to France, and kind of hooked up with with the scene of typographers there, and when we're pulling some resources, there's this whole uh, interest in Mediterranean design of letter form, kind of this Latin movement that is very much kind of pushed by this foundry, but uh, this is around 1950. He also did the Bizon. He did a lot of these before the Spanish Civil War. The family uh, kind of left uh, Catalonia to, to go, uh, I mean, Catalonia was, was deeply entrenched in the Spanish Civil War. They were in, um, in essentially kind of hiding during during the war, and but he started working on these typefaces before the war, and after the war, by 1940, he was able to release these typefaces, so Bizon. Uh, and uh, Muriel, and this is his father's work. This is uh, Esteban Trashut Bachman in the 1930s had, uh, was 
noticing how bad the some of the design was and he was very interested in helping printers local printers small printers to give them something different to give them something new uh, and he was very active in writing and he wanted to sort of lead by example so he created a series of al albums called uh, adam the acronym is adam so archivo documentario de arte moderna Documentary Archives of Modern Arts. It's kind of Art Deco. It's you know uh, essentially Art Deco, his version of Art Deco, and he's creating these really beautiful uh, albums to to help printers understand how to do things better, how to do things visually stronger, better, how to kind of expand their possibilities. And essentially, knowing that like if if someone sees something, they can copy it. They can make the same thing. You know, if they don't know that there's a trick that you can make something out of something else, they may not be you know. Uh, clued into it, and so he's very actively taking uh, advantage of that um, uh, the typographic system that I showed in, in, uh, from Iranzo. He's using it for a lot of the designs in Adam albums. There's a series of these that, that come out in the 1930s, so another element that played a huge part in uh, uh, Jean Trachut's uh, insight into like what needed to happen and these are some of the early drawings, kind of some of the early sketches for uh, what becomes essentially super velos. Uh, these are studies of how uh, these albums would be promoted. So uh, he's, he's, this is Schwann's work. Uh, it survives, these are hand drawn, but if you look at the, there's, there's a few pages that look exactly the same from the, the finished work. And, but these are mock-ups. Uh, initially it's called uh, Splex, but um, it, but it sort of became more of a um, super villas was sort of a, a, a catchier, a, a better name. But uh, the thing that he wanted to figure out is how to make these letter forms. You know, if you, so essentially like everything I just showed, uh, printers don't have photo engraving tools. Uh, how can you expand and make uh, a more robust version of what those founders are making um, but something that goes even further. It's not just like a set of squares and lines and, and circles or half circles and triangles. How can you make something that's a lot heftier and has a lot more flexibility to it? How can you make letter forms that could be made up for modules, but also then those same elements could be used for ornamentation, uh, for sort of flourishing, but also for illustrations? And that's the, 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 the space that he wants to occupy. He knows that printers don't have photo engraving. They're not going to get photo engraving for a long time. He wants them to do better. You know, he's taking the sort of the, the the picking up the torch from his father, from these Adam albums, and he wants to to give printers something in you know, even better, and using the same notion of creating these albums that would teach uh, printers how to do these things. So he's doing these very small sketches. He's influenced by this visual aesthetic of the Art Deco, and of this Art Modern, and he's piecing these things together. And the sketches are pretty fascinating. So in the end, this is some of the metal type that was produced, and I'll show you sort of how uh, the series played out. But this is what the t type looks like when it's cast, a few different sizes, uh, these very interesting elaborate pieces. And to make it work, it's a lot of work. So they called it super velos, which you know, means like super fast. It's anything but super fast. It's probably the slowest thing you could possibly imagine doing because it's really difficult to lock it up uh, because you're dealing with a lot of different sizes, different shapes. It's easier to do in a printing bed because you're dealing with rectilinear forms. You can kind of just snap things. You know, it just has it fits well together. But still, there's a, there's a lot of work that needs needs to be done. Um, and in order to make it successful, he needed to show uh, as much as he could uh, of how this works. But I'll, I'll run through basically the the gist of, of of kit of parts. It's a series of these modular elements. That becomes the core of what you would buy. So you have these these elements that were came in a few different variations, sort of like with patterns kind of attached to them to save the printers from filing the stuff anyway. They, you know, they knew that they might do it. Here's here's already like uh, the stuff done for you. So they had a couple of these versions of the same shapes with kind of these patterns cut into them. And then you had a series of additional forms that were narrower, taller, uh, lighter, at a few different sizes. And then you had complementary pieces. So you'd buy one of the three uh, core sets, and then you can buy additional elements. You could also just stick to like a very small set, and you can buy additional elements. And everything came in groups. So 
like fonts today, you can buy this with this, or if you want, you just get that weight, and you want the, the lights and bolds, like you can have that. So it was sort of mixable, and everything was, was delineated. These are kind of the more um, uh, comprehensive uh, catalogs of, of, of this type system, but it goes from very simple, very geometric things, roundy kind of geometric things. It, was, it, was, it doesn't have like uh, too strong of an affinity for very harsh edges and a lot of this like flourish stuff, which is kind of interesting in the context of this art deco. Like there's not a lot of this sort of stuff, but he's just kind of throwing it in there. And it does start to make sense when you see his, his use of it. So this goes on, <laughs> you know, you can have shapes, forms, little edges, like connections, snap-on things. Serifs, like, and everything is, you know, kind of sized, and and the the stems are similar. So you could, you know, you, if you bought uh, things at a certain size, they kind of work together. You just have to line it up, but the stems extended, and so the 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 thickness of the stuff on the bottom would connect to another piece somewhere along the way. So the the engineering of this is pretty profound uh, to make this much stuff. First to figure out what you want it to be, and then like make this stuff happen is is just bananas for me. It's, uh, but you know, it goes on and on. So, and then when you start piecing it together, you get some of this stuff. So he's showing you you can do display type. You know, go beyond the the three typefaces that you have in your kit. Now you have like fifty thousand fonts. Not quite, but the permutations were. Uh, several hundred options you know if you mixed pieces together you know it was like three styles in three styles times 11 with these additional elements the you know it's a really big quantity of options that you had like from the get-go um, so the possibilities are somewhat endless you could see how a similar shape of, of the yes at least those three with the addition of these kind of serify you know, stemmy kind of things become Pretty, pretty fluid and pretty flexible, and you can do different R's, different G's. And, you know, you can you can explore how things are made. And but you could see exactly the visual roots of of this stuff. It's it's coming from the same place that everything else in Spain is. This is a great one. It really takes color to make it really pop. I mean, it's a, it's a really fantastic thing when you see it printed. And and the albums is what I fell in love with seeing these these printed forms. They're all letterpress. So he, if you bought any piece of the system from from uh, the founder that produced it, you would get a book, uh, and I mean a book, uh, about 50, 60 pages, completely letter-pressed uh, by them that showed you how to use it, how to take advantage of the stuff, because the, basically it's like, it's not just a manual, it's like you really needed this thing to really understand like what you just bought. Um, and he spent so much time and so much effort making this really beautiful thing. And fortunately, there's a few sketches that survive where you can see how he's sort of thinking. So that's a sketch on, on the left, and that's a finished printed piece on the right. All letterpress, multiple colors, probably maybe six, maybe eight colors. Silver ink is used quite, quite often. But he's just saying, look, you, you know, do you need an engraving? No, you can like do this amazing fountain with type and stuff and just call it a day. Um, you know. So this is from, the, he produced a whole uh, series of four albums. They were called Nov Adam, so the new Adam, sort of the new revival of, of these Adam albums. The second one was in 1942. Um, the third and the fourth used pretty much uh, Super Velos exclusively. The first two were a bit of a mixture, but by, from 1942, this last one came out in 1952, it's pretty much just Super Velos. Uh, and this last one especially is interesting because he goes into a great deal of explanation and philosophy behind how type works and how things should... F it, it's really interesting to read it. It's, it's, um, it's printed in English, French, and Spanish. So it's pretty accessible. Um, so I'm going to show you, I'm going to focus a little bit on, on the fourth one. I spend more time. We've had this album for <clears throat> a little bit longer. In our collection, this is the thing I fell in love with probably like 15 years ago in, 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 our, in our archive. I'm still trying to figure out why we have it. I, I, I suspect it had to, it has to do with Aaron Burns because uh, Juan Trashut, I, I learned this this morning, he was invited to come uh, to a conference, Inspirational Typography, in 1966, that Aaron Burns put together. So it's very possible that when Juan came for the conference, he left this with, with uh, Aaron Burns. Aaron Burns left some of his material to our collection. Um, but these are scans from, from, from our uh, archive. 
And this is the cover of the last album, Novatum 4, 1952. Uh, He's using his own typeface, Bizont, which is the kind of the dominant uh, secondary typeface for most of it. Everything else is super veloce. Every single thing is super veloce. The back end made up of type lines of type and, and ornaments, the, that Egyptian hieroglyph is all super veloce. Two colors, three colors, four colors, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's, it's, it's insane. So I'm going to show you some of the pieces from it. The great thing about this book. Uh, is on the front is the design or samples of the design. You flip it over, on the back he shows you the pieces that go into the, that design. You cannot be more didactic than that. It's fantastic. It's like you could just copy it and just go and like make the same thing. So this is printed three color, one, two, three. Yeah, three color using only those elements. And you can see on the right, I'm cropping in, and you can see Spanish, uh, French, and English explanation. It's just a narrative as you flip the pages. It doesn't necessarily relate to what's on the front. He just says this long narrative about typography, his perspective on typography, what's good about it, what's bad about it, what's, what's to do. So it's just like you could read this stuff. You can also just follow the instructions like a Lego kid. You can like take these things. And it just goes on and on. Like I said, there's like 50, 60 pages. Everyone is like better than the next. Everything on the front there, minus the bizont italic on the bottom, is made using those elements. Nothing else. There's nothing else there. Nothing engraved, nothing, it's just this stuff. And what's amazing is you start to find like this insane range of forms. It's like if you have to make these shapes, you're going to do some wacky, amazingly weird things. And that's where it really, for me, becomes like something that goes beyond this kind of rooted uh, system in Art Deco with very sort of limited means. His ingenuity and inventiveness in these forms is pretty astounding. Look at this. How about that? <laughs> Little composing stick. The artist and the printer. He's, he's drawing and he's typesetting at the same time. It's awesome. Type, a little bit of type at the top there, his own type, uh, and the uh, super velos. And if you look at the caption, kind of at the top caption before the, uh, at the top of the three columns, uh, three paragraphs of text, and it, he explains the secondary typefaces. So if you wanted to know what the other typefaces are, it's all credited there. Spitura, Pizont, uh, Juventud, everything is listed there. So you, you're never not sure what, what you're looking at. It's amazing. But the color of it, this is letterpress, pure letterpress, right? So to do each color, it's a separate pass and registration. So these, these are volumes of, of books that he prints letterpress, sheet by sheet. That's why they spiral bound them because it's the only way really to get this to, to come together after you've letterpressed pages and pages of the stuff, sometimes five, six passes of each sheet, you're going to need the spiral bound uh, piece to hold it all together. Some samples of showing labels, cards, uh, a huge emphasis towards jobbing work. Um, and he does show you what it takes. Uh, here's, you know, it's printed as a, as a sketch. So this is how I'm thinking about making this design on the right. So the following page is just like this tissue, uh, printed tissue showing graph paper and showing a, a drawing that he made in order to follow. So he's instructing people, like, if you're going to think through this, take some graph paper and start, you know, mocking things up. I think that's wishful thinking, but it's, you know, he's, he's trying his best. But, and who knows if it's traced from the print, who knows, I don't know, it's too close, but... Pretty neat. Um, but he, you know, seeing his other sketches, you can tell he did a lot of planning. He did a lot of work to sort of get the stuff to work together. Wine labels, there you go. You want some stuff? You know, it's just, you know, it's just uh, uh, at your beck and call. It's just, it's profound. Like, the stuff just, it's like, it's all over the shop. I mean, it's just like, he moves through such diverse territory. You know, all... Like the big type and the illustration made using super velos. Okay. <laughs> That's a good one. I love this guy. It's just just those shapes put together. That's a good one. And you never know. Like if you if you think about these like very simple kits kit of parts, you can do a lot of really fun stuff with this. Like there's there's a lot of typefaces of like kind of lingering within this, just out of out of the lettering that he does with with these things. But look at how few pieces it takes to make the illustration and that that type, the the title Maria. 
it's all you know using that that very small set of parts. I mean, obviously you need a few um, pieces, a few copies of each one, but it's all there. That's a great one, like a, a letterhead for something called Monterey. Uh, show this closer, right? Like that's that's legit lettering. That's like serious lettering. It's made using these like snap-on weirdo things. It's amazing. And that illustration, look at that illustration. It's three colors. Look at the, the shadow on the left side of the building. It's that third color. It just kind of hits underneath. It's awesome. He's so good. He's so inventive. It's amazing. Same pieces. You know, the top lettering, the bottom, palm trees. It's cool. Tiny, I mean, like the effort that he went to to make you believe in this thing is profound. I just have the most, like, utmost respect for this guy. Just to, the sheer uh, um, motivation and, and dedication to this to this craft. I mean, he was so convinced that this is the best way to do it, uh, and he really wanted to prove that. Here's a good one: uh, springtime and you in France. Um, complex piece of design. Those are the pieces, very few, very few pieces, uh, or at least like modules. Uh, and then he breaks it down for you. You know, in the book he shows you color by color the breakdown of what it takes to print something like that. So, you know, you start with that, or that might be the last plate, but then you have the red, then you hit the blue, and then you print the green, and you print this other thing, all on top of each other, right? Then you have to lock up the press every single time with that. <laughs> Not fast. <laughs> Not fast at all, but look at the results that you get out of uh, out of this amazing thing. Uh, but the lettering is all done using this. Let me backtrack. See the the plates. The, you know, you get really good registration on a letterpress, but that's a lot of work. That's a lot of stuff to ask. So he's like showing you how to sketch this. He's showing you how to break down the colors. This is it's very didactic. He just, he really wants you to use it. He really wants you. You bought it. You're like here and just don't mess it up. You can do it. And then he has pages and pages of typefaces that could be put together. And he gave him names, too. And then, so in a way, it's like if you're, you know, not very imaginative, you can't come up with your own typefaces, look at the page and follow the, you know, the, the structure. Like, take this shape, take this shape, and then you have a full alphabet. And he did a number of these. I'm only showing, like, a few. There's some swans. Why not? Um, in, in a way, you could see his other typefaces, the, especially Bizont, the way it kind of has a very similar uh, organic kind of a, a very tall stem structure with kind of these curly uh, ends to, uh, to each side. But you know, this is very much built into Supervelos, which he had been working for a while uh, during, during this period. And it does show up in use. It was used. It was bought. It was, you know, popular. Uh, other, other printers <laughs> loved it, uh, either... Uh, uh, they set their own stife in, in Super Velos uh, to promote themselves. Uh, I'll show you a close-up of, of this one. It's fantastic. The colors and the, and the, the, uh, the flexibility that it has. So it, it did okay. It did okay in, in Spain. Not amazing, but it did okay. Uh, it's so hard to use. I mean, it, it's not an easy thing to... There's a pretty steep learning curve. You're going to do very simple things, um, just time-wise. I mean, you know, the whole point of printing, especially jobbing printing, is you could do it quickly. Like, if you're going to take forever to setting this up, it's it's not something you maybe will, will kind of go uh, to the trouble of. But um, it did well here, and then also did well in France and Belgium, sort of through the Catalan network of immigrants and the founders. It, did, uh, it was republished uh, by FTF. Uh, it was sold rather uh, by them. Uh, you can you can buy it in France, and it did okay in France and Belgium. Strangely, it reached all the way up to Belgium, but FTF had a, a good a good reach there. And again, like the Catalan community helped um, sort of popularize it. But it's a, it's it's a very Spanish. It's kind of a, a, a it's, it's fun. It's more playful and, and um, tapped into some of the French uh, stuff that was going on by. Uh, Cruz Vidal, another really interesting person who deserves his own his own talk, but these are fantastic little uh, life uh, samples. So if you if you travel around Spain, you, you're bound to come up with something like this, especially if you visit a, a small printer, a printing shop, you might find something. And it has been revived. It has been digitized recently or not so recently. It's, time flies by. Uh, to me, it seems recent, like 2003. Uh, Andrew Baliush and uh, Alex Trachut uh, worked together to make a digital revival of uh, 
faithful reproduction of the entire system. The entire kit of parts is a digital typeface. It comes in different styles. You can buy one, two, three, or four. I think there's four different styles that have the core elements, the sort of the decorative elements, and then additional forms that you can piece together. It's it's robust uh, and it's complex. You know, it's 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 a uh, you have to, you know, you have to know, you have to kind of plan. You have to, you have to figure out how, how to use it. Uh, the best example, one of the best examples I've seen it in use um, was in 2011. Uh, Astrid Stravero Studio did the AGI Open Conference uh, in, when AGI went, was in Barcelona. Uh, they created the whole branding uh, based on the Super Velo stuff. There's a good, there's, there's a few more images on fonts and use uh, that show a, a bit more of the system. Um, but they were very simple, kind of pared down using the uh, initials of all the speakers, all the members, all the um, people who are participating to, to, to make these really beautiful, fun, playful things using these, making initials out of the Super Velo stuff. It's great. Every single thing is different. You have endless possibilities and endless permutation. They kept the color palette pretty pretty limited, just to let the forms kind of do their magic and that kind of paired with a, a kind of an accent color. It's a really smart way of of getting these things to kind of work together. Um, and it's super strong visually, and, and kind of you you could see it. Uh, you create a very strong visual visual brand for it. Um, and I think that's my last slide, but I, I'm really fascinated by the, by this idea. And I think the just the history and the story behind it is really awesome. But I think like, if you think about the contemporary technology of what you can do with OpenType, um, that's it's interesting to just just move, I'll leave it with 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 that. Just like what is possible potentially with given how advanced the type technology has become. This doesn't necessarily need to be revived and in its purest form because the style is potentially um, too dated, but the idea behind it is pretty amazing. And I think that like, someone could, could do something, someone could really run with, with this concept and, and, and create something pretty, pretty profound. So thank you very much.